You never get the eyes right. Guillermo del Toro loves monsters. Like, really loves them. And I like Guillermo del Toro's films, mainly because he is the epitome of a dying breed of directors who really study and adore film. But when they make a film, it's not about the simple details of narrative, structure, character, music, or just plain entertainment. Instead, he is focusing on the subconscious things normal moviegoers don't notice or even care to. Someone like del Toro, Unlike his two peers, Alfonso Cuaron, Alejandro Gonzalez in Iritu, Del Toro is not trying to make the next Breathless, the next Citizen Kane, or reinvent cinema into a narrativeless montage of emotions. No, Del Toro is trying to instead, if anything, make the next Mad Max 2. because he can make something like Pacific Rim and initial it with his sensibilities without stopping himself from making pure blockbuster entertainment. He makes a superhero film and it's not about the superhero stopping the villain and saving the world. It's about that moment when Novak in Blade 2 finds inexplicable peace in death and decides to end his own life. Or when Blade, a man who hates vampires more than anything, finds himself in love with one and granting her a last wish, seeing the sun rise. Also, the final moments of both are conveyed in a powerful or poetic way. compared to the other vampires in the film, where they just turn to stone or combust into a fiery red. But Del Toro has Blade fulfill another promise we'd forgotten from the opening of the film that is purely spectacle of seeing Blade being the badass vampire hunter he is. Well, you didn't think I forgot about you, did you? <laughs> These moments, just frames away from one another, personifies Del Toro's films more, I think, than Pan's Labyrinth or Shape of Water. He is a down-to-earth director, and far from the pretentious vices of many of his peers, he's my favourite filmmaker. Huh? And Blade 2 was practice for his real superhero film, an incomplete trilogy in my opinion, Hellboy. Turn the pages, please, if you don't mind. Please. An incredibly detailed world built meticulously. Hellboy is literally a boy in a monster's body, and both Hellboy and Golden Army is this massive story arc in Hellboy becoming a man, or more specifically, a father. What is it that makes a man a man? Is it his origins, the way things start, or is it something else, something harder to describe? Hellboy 1 is about losing his and two about becoming one. The lines between Del Toro's fantasy world he takes seriously, and superhero is small. Look at them ugly suckers, Blue. One sheet of glass between them and us. Story of my life. Hellboy also highlights Del Toro's own arc as a director. Although Hellboy is still a great film, it's Del Toro finding his feet in the genre, and studio filmmaking itself. From the first film we have world building mythos and the monster love story evident in Blade that is played down. You know the thirst better than any of us, shooting that serum of yours. The only difference between us is that I made peace with what I am a long time ago.
here in full form and if anything overbearing. Needless to say, Del Toro would make a whole film out of this, and it would win a couple of awards. I wish I could do something about this. I can't. The soundtrack used in the first Hellboy, I feel, is Del Toro playing with genre, as he seems to be setting a mood for a romantic comedy. Hey, your chili's getting cold. Not hungry. That would be the linchpin in the second film, as the same kind of music also sporadically returns. This is the kind of melding of opposites I love about Del Toro. We have a scene like this, and a scene like this in the same movie. I have always liked this kind of genre melding because it takes a lot to make it work, and when it does, just sometimes you have the perfect movie. So I just did some talking to the sun and I said I didn't like the way he got things or it can just go horribly wrong the two films are about Hellboy learning the value of his friends it takes a traumatising event to call on this change in this hero's journey that may lead him to destruction. The subject that pops up again and again in the film is death. Beginning with a death of a friend, Abe's near-death experience, junk face keeps popping up. Samuel, I'm the resurrection. Uh. <laughs> Didn't I kill you already? Of course, his father. Hey, friend. And a literal embodiment of death in the second film. And at the end of the day, it's his job to stop this from happening. My job. And it's when he name. doesn't, he reacts like a kid would. I want, I want that thing locked up. You're not old enough to be giving me advice. It's about accepting who he is. If Hellboy was to change in an instant, the film wouldn't work. It is a gradual process in both films, and probably would have reached a tipping point in the third film. If trilogy rules are any help, the third film would have called back to the first film's origin story. The death of his father is a very powerful moment in Hellboy, as it begins the call to grow up. He was busy being jealous, while his father was being slain, so this call to do what is right is tied in with a constant reference to death. But Hellboy's father is replaced by the most sensible surrogate. In fact, it's with whom he avenges his father's death. This is Del Toro being a true filmmaker, hey, wait up. letting these two films live separately instead of needing to watch both of them, as they both have these subtle threads woven into them. Don't even think about it. <laughs> Hellboy retcons the fact that Del Toro is trying to create his Frankenstein and his Mad Max in one big movie. Comparing Del Toro to Sam Remy again, Hellboy 2 is clearly the superior film. The middle of the journey is always the best because most people are on their long journey to the middle. They hate me. Yeah. Well, you'll meet them all again on their long journey to the middle. Another thing I like about Del Toro is how he treats his villains. As I've shown before, Blade does not really kill the bad guy in Blade 2. He chooses to end his own life. The hardest villain to sympathise with is the first Hellboy, but even he has his final moments given to him in true Del Toro fashion. Hell will hold no surprises for us. This empathetic writing approach to villains in his films shows the thin line between being the hero and the villain very evident in Hellboy. The second film, very reminiscent of Blade, has an anti-hero antagonist of sorts for the monsters. Not dead. What a 
truly Del Toro's most sympathetic villain, as Abe falls in love with his twin, who are mortally connected. Hellboy 2 is so perfect in my opinion, overlooked as well. The template sequel in this genre is Spider-Man 2. We have our heroes, who have everything thrown at them from every which angle. Liz, you're pregnant. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. As he struggles to make sense of who he wants to be or become. We already know that Hellboy has not chosen to bring upon Armageddon, and Hellboy 2, he has the repercussions of that. Technically speaking, Del Toro's drift in camera movement, which he has developed over his career, is in full display here, as it does not stop moving. We just have a more experienced Del Toro in this film, and I sense an audience awareness of who exactly are watching these films, other than the fans of his work, as two fairy carcasses and blood makes visible and audible contact with the camera lens multiple times. A way more comfortable filmmaker. Hellboy is not a sensible hero. Abe, I think Liz is still mad at me. Still the same channel. Oh. Literally revealing his existence to the world in the midst of arguing semantics with Liz and fighting off a horde of killer tooth fairies. Hey, you're missing this. <laughs> We're on TV. Now all the glorious creature design, all as detailed as this baby tumor. Feeling a little chattier now. Oh, never talk. <laughs> and castle head with literal creatures living in his dome. <gasps> Follow me. And what about the jumping bean? Kill him. Last fight to accept who he is is distilled in a poetically stunning scene in Del Toro's career, hidden in one of his most commercialized films, as Hellboy has to kill a monster in a monster movie. Look at it, the last of its kind. If the first film is about origin and fate, the second is acceptance of death as Hellboy and his friends are stopping the harbingers of death in the Golden Army. This scene here, when Dr. Krauss, voiced by Seth MacFarlane, reanimates a tooth fairy, only for it to suffocate to death. There we are. So but that simple moment carries on into the rest of the film, as it encapsulates a lot of Hellboy 2's meaning. The twins who are mortally linked, as one cannot live without the other. Krauss, who is brought upon Hellboy by his revealing his identity, personifies this chapter. You have brought this unto yourself. What? Washington is sending down a new BPRD agent. A new guy? Why? To look after you. As a kind of spectre who pops up out of nowhere. In a way, he replaces Myers. As he was introduced to replace Hellboy's father figure, is used to invoke this hex on Hellboy that death follows him everywhere. He has to again come to terms with hunting down monsters and being one himself. The humans. They will tire of you. While the film is stylistically different as it draws reference more from crime cappers of the 50s and 40s, while you also get glimpses of moments where Del Toro is just plain experimenting, like when Hellboy throws this punch, you can hear the sound of a stock car revving before impact. as Del Toro goes for a more light-hearted sound design. Yet again, we have a film that has moments like this. You have more in common with us than with them. You could be a king. Then a moment like this. You only knew what I am going through. I just can't smile without you. The essence of Hellboy is he is no longer a monster. He's a character. A rhyme. Hey, friend, what about that which is mine? Don't forget about me. What about me? Friend? Look at the birdie. 